Well, let me uh, pray as we begin. Father, we thank you that you are with us always until the end of the age. You are with us when we rejoice, and you are with us when we grieve. And you promise to meet us in your word as you breathe it into our hearts. Please do that now, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 23 has been a favorite for thousands of years, and it holds a special, uh, maybe bittersweet place in the hearts of many believers. It's often read or sung at hospital beds and funerals. And this short poem has helped men and women to be human in the face of tragedy, to hang on to their dignity and hope, even in the shadow of death. If I had to pick one verse that gets to the heart of the psalm, it's the last one, verse 6, and have a look with me there. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, that's the heart of the psalm. This is the promise God makes to anyone who is led by him. And today, we get the first half of that verse. We get to be pursued. And our pursuers are goodness and mercy. Our lifelong companions are steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what we get to have now. One day we get the second half. We get to have a home, a room in the house of the Lord. So your story doesn't end in a grave, but in a house. And your name doesn't end on a stone, but on a door. Because in the house of the Lord, there's a room with your name on it. That's what we get in the end. So verse 6 is the heart of the psalm. And this is the promise God makes to anyone who is willing to follow him. And if you were listening carefully when the psalm was read, you may have noticed that the subject of nearly every verb, the one who does everything, is God himself. He is the one who leads and restores and comforts. He is the one who prepares and anoints and pursues. He is the one who does it all. So this is not a psalm about our commitment to the Lord, but his commitment to us. And this is not a psalm about our faith in him, but his faithfulness to us. In other words, this psalm is not a command or a charge or even an example to be followed. It's a promise from the Lord to us. And this is helpful because this is the only way you will ever have real comfort and hope. If it all depends on us, if we are self-made, self-ruled, independent beings, as our culture wants us to believe, then your comfort runs out when your strength runs out. And your future is only as certain as your ability to accomplish it. Self-made independent beings have no real comfort or hope. Because to put it bluntly, you cannot shepherd yourself through death. But if you're willing to be led, if you're willing to follow God wherever he may take you, if you're willing to be the sheep and let the Lord be your shepherd, what you get is verse 6. You get goodness and faithfulness for all of your days. And then in the end, a place to call home. God is the one who does it all. And that's why there's comfort and hope. Now, there are three exceptions to what I just said. Three times in this psalm, David uses the pronoun I. So three times, I is the subject of the verb. Verse 1, I shall not want... Verse 4, 
I will not fear. And verse 6, I shall dwell. And uh, each time David is sharing with us the personal, individual experience of being led by the Lord, of having him as your shepherd. So for the rest of our time together, we'll take a closer look at each of those lines. Verse 1, David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Notice, first of all, that this is in the future tense. So David is telling us what will be true in the future. I shall not want. I will lack nothing because the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I don't often go uh, to the Hebrew or the Greek. It's a little unfair. It's like I've got the ace of spades and you can't beat it because I know the Hebrew and most of you don't, and that's a little unfair. Uh, so I tend not to go to the Hebrew unless it's helpful, unless it adds to our understanding. And in this case, it does. The word translated as green in verse 2 is the word for new grass or fresh grass. So it's the first grass after the dry season, and it comes up after the first rain, usually in the fall after a very dry summer. And that tells us where the sheep have been and where they're about to go. They've been wandering in the desert. They've had no rain for months. But the shepherd is leading them to new grass, to the first sign of green after the first autumn rain. They're about to be fed and watered and restored after long months of wandering in the wilderness. That's where they're going. So David is telling us what is about to be true, what will happen very soon. And very soon, God will lead his people out of the desert and into an oasis. And in that very near future, I shall not want. I will lack nothing in that place where God is leading me. Now, what does that imply about the present? Well, right now, I am still in the wilderness. I am not in the place of rest. I am hungry and thirsty and lacking, and I desperately need to be restored. Even in a place like Greenwich, I think we all know that in some sense we are still in the wilderness. We have not arrived at the place of rest because we still lack. We want for something more. Um, you might have experienced this if you've ever achieved one of your goals. So maybe you got into the best school, and then you got the best job, and then you bought the best house, and then you bought the best second house. Maybe you've achieved everything you've ever wanted. Uh, if that's you, I'd love to know what that's like. But here's the thing. We already know what that's like. We've heard the story before, haven't we? We just heard Ecclesiastes preached over the summer. And the writer of that book, he won the game of life. He ended up with the biggest pile of everything. He had more money and more knowledge and more pleasure than everyone else combined. And do you know what he said at the end of his life? He said, it's all meaningless. That's remarkable, isn't it? Here's a man who won the game of life, and he says, I could not have felt more empty. And here's the thing. Ecclesiastes is not the only story that ends like that. It's a very common story. We all know what it's like, whether it's the new house, the new job, the new hobby. We all know what it's like to achieve something that thrills us for a moment, but disappoints us in the end. We're still in the wilderness. We've not yet arrived. Because even when we get to the top, we find that there's nothing there. But the Lord is leading me to a place, and there I shall not want. 
Now, the problem with our culture is that we want to swap the he for we. So instead of he makes me lie down, it's we can save the world. And instead of he leads me beside, it's we can find our own way. And instead of he restores my soul, it's we find happiness within. We turn to ourselves to find the happiness we need. The secular humanist motto is be the change you want to see. And most people vastly prefer that to the Lord is my shepherd. But isn't that a crushing burden to lay on anyone? Be the change you want to see. What about the things you cannot change? What about the things you cannot fix? Some things in this world cannot be mended. What if it's your heart that is broken? But there is a place where I shall not want, where even heartbreak can be mended. And the Lord says to those who are hungry and thirsty, those of us wandering in the desert, come to me and you will never hunger. Believe in me and you will never thirst. There is a place where even your tears will be wiped away, where there's no reason to cry anymore. The Lord knows where that is. And the question is, will we allow him to lead us there? David knows what it's like to have the Lord as his shepherd. And he says, I shall not want. The second time David uses the word I is in verse 4. I will not fear. And that's a remarkable thing to say, given where he is. So verses 1 to 3, David tells us where the Lord is leading him. He's leading him out of the wilderness and into a place of rest. But verse 4, he tells us where he is now. And right now, it's not just any wilderness. It's the valley of the shadow of death. And David knows what it's like to live in that shadow. He lost at least three children that we know of. One boy died in infancy. Then one of his boys killed the other. And that third boy was then killed by his army. David knows what it's like to live in the shadow of death. And every family gathering becomes a bittersweet occasion because you're happy. You're happy for the people who are there, truly happy for the birthdays, the holidays, the celebrations. But you'll always notice the ones who are missing, the ones who aren't coming anymore. David was in the valley of the shadow of death. And one day, all of us will find that we are there. If you're not there already, it's the one valley that all of us must travel. And I do appreciate the realism of this psalm. It's honest. It's truthful. It doesn't pull its punches. There are dark valleys in this world. And David doesn't erase them out of the picture. Apparently, you can do that with these new phones. You can edit the background and remove the things that are spoiling your picture. And every picture of Psalm 23 does that. I don't know if you noticed, but all the pictures of this psalm stop at verse 3. So we get the sheep in the pasture and the waters of rest, and it's peaceful and beautiful and sunny. But we never see the valley of the shadow of death. All the pictures stop at verse 3. But David doesn't do that. He gives us a truthful account of life in this world, of life in the valley. And just think about what happens when you lose the realism of this psalm. If you're expecting God 
to lead you around the valley instead of through it. If you think following God means that you will never have to walk in that valley, you will give up when you fall under the shadow of death. I've met Christians who have given up on God because their loved ones died even after they prayed. But David lives in a world where everyone dies and the Lord leads his people even through the valley of death. But listen to what David says in verse 4. Even if the Lord makes me walk through that valley, he says, I will not fear. Now, this is not to say that Christians will always be fearless. We are weak and limited and often plagued with doubts. But this is to say that we have no reason to fear that our fear is in some sense unwarranted. And David is saying that if you have the Lord as your shepherd, then it is perfectly rational to say, I will not fear, even if you are in the shadow of death. Now, what inspires such confidence? How can David be so sure? What are the reasons for his lack of fear? Well, the first one comes in verse 3. And uh, if you look at the footnotes in your text, uh, you'll see that the more literal translation is, uh, he leads me in the right paths. He leads me in the right paths. Now, what makes these paths the right ones? Well, they're the paths that lead to the pastures of grass, to the waters of rest, to the place where our souls are restored. So verse three, the shepherd leads me in the right paths, but notice verse four, the path doesn't go around the valley, but through it. Apparently this is the right path, the one that goes through the valley of the shadow of death. And the shepherd knows where he's going, He's taking us to the waters of rest. But he says, this is the way. And it's through the valley, not around it. And there will be times in your life when you'll find yourself in a particular valley. And you will say, is this really the only way? Do we have to go through this valley? Of all the valleys in the world, does it really have to be this one? But the Lord does not promise that we will understand everything he does. He does promise that he will get us there in the end. And he leads me in the right paths, the ones that will get us there. It's amazing, isn't it, that David is able to say that after losing three of his sons. Charles Spurgeon once put it like this. God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. God has every intention of bringing his people home to the place where their souls are restored. And he leads me in the right paths. Here's the second reason David has no fear, and it comes at the end of verse 3. For his name's sake. That's why he leads me in the right paths. He does it for his name's sake. And that just means that God's reputation is on the line. Um, if you run a small business, you will know that reputation matters. So just the other week, we were looking for a new place to order takeout and we picked the place with the highest ratings and we avoided the places with bad reviews. Reputation matters. And if you're a restaurant, 
You want to be known for making good food. If you're a doctor, you want to be known for healing the sick. If you're God, you want to be known for leading people home. The Lord is in the shepherding business, and it's his job to get his people home, to bring them from the valley of death to the waters of rest. And if he doesn't get us there, if he loses a single sheep along the way, then he is not worthy of his name. And if he picks the wrong path, or if he picks a path that is harder than it needs to be, if he makes his people suffer any more than necessary, then he is not good, or wise, or faithful. Again, we are not told why it has to be this path, why it has to be this valley. But the Lord is saying to each and every one of us, I will get you there. My reputation is on the line. And if I lose even one of you, if I make a single mistake, then I am not worthy of my name. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. The third reason David has no fear comes at the end of verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now these are weapons. So the shepherd is armed. And the rod is basically a bat, and he uses it to beat off the wolf and the robber. Now the last time I got in a fight was in middle school, uh, which was the last time I was big enough to pick a fight. Uh, but that day, I knew who my friends were, because my friends were willing to fight. They were not afraid to get hit. And Jesus plays with this image in John chapter 10, and he sets up a very simple test. And he says there's an easy way to tell whether someone is a good shepherd or just a hired hand. Because when the wolf comes, the hired hand runs away. But the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now I know verse 4 is hard to believe, especially when you're in the valley, when you're getting hurt, when your heart is getting broken. It is easy to think that the Lord has failed the test, that he's the hired hand who ran away. But Jesus did not run away. When danger came, he did not run. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he died to protect his people. He ran into the valley, not away from it, and he got hurt, and his heart got broken. And today it's the same Jesus who leads us. The same Jesus who is with us in the valley, the one who died to protect us, is the one holding the rod and the staff. And if we are hurting, and our hearts are getting broken, it's not because Jesus ran away. He's protecting you from something. He's keeping you safe from something. What that is, I do not know. But I do know this. This shepherd does not abandon his sheep. And his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Because I know who my shepherd is. Even if the Lord makes me walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because the one leading me knows the way, and his reputation is on the line. And he ran into the valley, not away from it. This is no hired hand. This is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. David uses the word I, 
one last time at the end of verse 6. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now here David is changing the metaphor from shepherd to host. And it's worth reflecting on the similarities and differences between those two images. But both the shepherd and the host have total responsibility for those under their care. And there was great shame if you failed anyone under your care. That's how they're the same. The difference is that the shepherd is on the move. He's leading the sheep from one place to another. But the host stays put. He has no reason to go anywhere because he's already home. And just look at the way David paints the picture. In the house of the Lord is a table bursting with food and a cup that overflows. The host has spared no expense to prepare this meal for his guests. And maybe it's a little early to talk about Thanksgiving, but that's the picture here. This isn't the sandwich you pack for lunch. This is the biggest meal of the year. And in the middle of verse 5, David says, You anoint my head with oil. That was a sign of respect. That was a way of saying, welcome, and please stay as long as you want. Now we do this now with a handshake or a hug or a kiss on the cheek. They did it then by anointing your head with oil. It was a basic courtesy, one that was often denied Jesus by his enemies. But this host will treat you with dignity and respect. He won't treat you like dirt. He will treat you like a human being, like an honored guest. And you are welcome in his house, and you can stay as long as you want, because there will be no end to this feast. And your enemies, the ones who took your dignity away, they will be made to watch. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And if you've ever lost a loved one, you'll know how dehumanizing death really is. It robs us of our dignity. It takes away the things that make us human. When we die, we no longer breathe or speak or laugh or play or run. Death treats us like dirt. And we do our best to dignify the dead with funerals and burials and pictures and eulogies. But if you've watched someone die in the hospital, there is no dignity there. Death treats us like dirt. But the Lord will not allow that for his people. He will not have it in his house. The Christian's life does not end in a grave, but at a table. And instead of being covered with dirt, she will be anointed with oil. And the people of God will be taunting their enemies, and which may not sound like a Christian thing to do, until you realize that our greatest enemy is death. David says that our enemies will not have the victory. They'll be forced to watch as we enjoy this feast. So one day, instead of burying your loved ones, you'll be watching them dance in victory over their graves, because they do not belong to death. They belong to the house of the Lord. The Lord treats his people like honored guests. And there's nothing, that can, and there's nothing death can do about it but watch. Let me close with this. Verse 6 is what you get if you're willing to be led by the Lord. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the heart of the psalm. 
This is the promise God makes to anyone who is led by him. Today we get the first half of that verse. We get to be pursued. We get to be followed and harassed for as long as we live because God is the one chasing us down and he won't let us go into the valley alone. And God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when bad things happen, he doesn't stop being good. And he doesn't stop being wise. He's still chasing after us with goodness in one hand and faithfulness in the other. And we may not understand what he does, but we have every reason to trust his heart. One day we get the second half. We get to have a home. So your story doesn't end in a grave, but in a house. And your name doesn't end on a monument, but on a guest list. Because in the house of the Lord, there's a seat at his table with your name on it. And I cannot wait to see who else will be sitting at my table. So are you willing to be led by him? Are you willing to follow him wherever he may take you? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will not fear. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's close in prayer. Father, you are too good to be unkind and too wise to be mistaken. Even when we find ourselves in the valley, help us to remember that you are with us and you are leading us to the waters of rest. Thank you that we have a home and a seat at your table and a cup that overflows in a place where death no longer wins. So help us to trust in you alone. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.